Having moved beyond the single enterprise and the production sphere of capital, Marx began to heavily employ and develop circulation and turnover as crucial components in the process of capital. We have already seen before how circulation affects and is affected by the production process, how its role in the endless accumulation of capital is integral for expansion. In this video, we will focus closely on circulation and the turnover of capital. To begin with, when we use the term turnover, we are referring to a completed cycle of capital, from its start in the money form to its inevitable and necessary return to the money form. As specified in the video on the various circuits of industrial capital, the money form need not be the starting point for capital. More accurately, there is no starting point in a process that is by definition cyclical. We start with money, as Marx often does, purely for conceptual reasons. Circulation time affects turnover as it is one of the two components that determine turnover time, the other being the production time. Marx interestingly notes that a major element affecting circulation time is the development of the means of transport and communication. The means of transport in particular influences the volume of commodity capital moving through space at any given time. As such, developments in the means of transport affect circulation time. Marx also points out that as transportation networks evolve and build upon themselves, major circulation points wax and wane. What was once a major center declines, while a new nexus at the crossroads of various transportation paths rise in importance. This dynamic has been maintained since Marx's time, as new modes of transportation and improvements to the old ones reshape the geography of circulating capital. While innovations and advancement in the communication and transportation are key to improving circulation time, another key determinant for circulation is the presence of what Marx calls stocks. Marx stresses that in order for capital to circulate efficiently, there need to be stocks in each subcategory of capital. In this particular use of the term, Marx is talking about reserves of capital, whether it be in its productive, commodity, or money form. The most important reserves are those of money capital, as they are needed for the constant renewal and flow of the whole process. In Volume 2, Marx uses a series of examples to illustrate how productive and commodity capital overlap in order to maximize efficiency during turnover time. Production and circulation are staggered so that one part of capital is in the production sphere, while the other is in the circulation sphere. If this were not the case, and the capitalists followed instead a sequential order of operations, there would be periods of inactivity where capital would sit around uselessly. Instead of producing and circulating in a sequence, the capitalist is better off running multiple overlapping capital circuits, so that he or she may produce and sell simultaneously thereby avoiding a situation in which large portions of capital are left to collect dust as they wait for their turn. Marx elaborates on why this is important. Quote, the economists, who have never produced a clear account of the turnover mechanism, constantly overlook this basic aspect, i.e. the fact that only a part of the industrial capital can actually be engaged in the production process if production is to proceed without interruption. In other words, one part can function as productive capital only on condition that another part is withdrawn from production proper in the form of commodity or money capital. Since this is overlooked, so also is the importance and role of money capital in general." End quote. What is most crucial here is the emphasis on the necessity of coexistence of the various forms of capital. This observation demonstrates precisely why a break in the chain, regardless of the specific place, would bring the whole process to a standstill. Moreover, Marx takes the time to demonstrate the ways in which turnover and magnitude of capital advanced can be altered by exogenous forces, such as changes in the prices of materials of production, or even the produced commodities themselves. This, again, helps to reinforce the notion of the interconnectedness of capitals, and the way in which even minute changes in the chains of production and circulation can create a ripple effect across the whole production process and even the adjacent production processes. From the discussion of turnovers, we can consider another valuable observation. All other variables held constant, enterprises with a higher frequency of turnovers will produce more surplus value over a given period of time. Marx shows us this in his exploration of the turnover of variable capital. In these scenarios, Marx abstracts away constant capital as it has no effect on the rate of surplus value. He also assumes a surplus value rate of 100%. He then gives us the example of two capitals, A and B. Capital A is a variable capital of $500 and turns over 10 times a year. Knowing that the annual rate of surplus value is simply the rate of surplus value multiplied by the number of turnovers, we get the following equation. Plugging in our numbers for capital A, we get capital A's annual surplus rate is therefore 1000%. 
We also know capital A's total annual surplus value using a variation of the same equation. In other words, capital A starts with $500 at the beginning of the year, producing $500 in surplus every cycle. After 10 cycles, at the end of the year, capital A has produced $5,000 in surplus, and thus has an annual surplus rate of 1,000%. Marx then introduces capital B. Capital B starts with $5,000 at the beginning of the year, but it completes only one cycle, that is to say, it only has one turnover in the whole year. Capital B's total annual surplus product also amounts to $5,000. However, its annual rate of surplus value is quite different. Plugging it into our equation, we get Capital B begins with a variable capital of $5,000, which, assuming a constant surplus value rate of 100%, yields only $5,000 in surplus value. Capital B has thus only doubled in size, capital A, on the other hand, has increased tenfold over the course of the year. In other words, higher turnover frequencies yield a greater rate of surplus value. This is quite intuitive, because the rate of surplus value is determined in large part by the initial capital put forward into a given production process. A particularly long turnover, say, one that lasts an entire year, will necessarily require a greater magnitude of capital to get the process started. Essentially, a small amount of capital that has many turnovers can generate the same amount of surplus value at the end of the year as a large amount of capital with few turnovers. It follows from what we just considered, that where the amount of turnovers per year is exactly one, the annual rate of surplus value will be the same as the rate of surplus value. Where the turnover rate is greater than one per year, the annual rate of surplus value will be greater than the rate of surplus value. And lastly, where the turnover rate is less than one per year, the annual rate of surplus value will be less than the rate of surplus value. We can conclude by noting that Marx laid all this out in a time when transportation and communication were considerably less advanced than they are today. The logistics of circulation have greatly improved in the last century and a half. However, just because the overall frequency of turnovers may be greater than it was before, it does not automatically mean that the annual rate of surplus value has tended upwards in an absolute sense. The annual rate of surplus value is, after all, equally affected by the rate of surplus value itself, which we know to be constantly shifting as well. Marx makes it clear that there are too many moving parts pushing and pulling capital in various directions for a consistent and overarching trend to surface. The tendency of the rate of profit to fall, for example, counteracts possible gains in the annual rate of surplus value, and vice versa. And even within the tendency of the rate of profit to fall, there are many contradictory forces at play. That brings us to the end of this video. Reflections, suggestions, and questions are highly encouraged in the comment section below. Thank you for watching, and until next time, remember, the philosophers have only interpreted the world in various ways. The point is to change it.